Um, we already have a, a couple of questions. I, I'm going to ask the attendees to be a little bit patient because now I really want to ask and go to the growers. Um, again, we can <clears throat> start this time with Bruce. So I'm going to do it the other way around from west to east. Um, Bruce, what we would like to know if you can give very briefly, um, just a kind of an overview of what you think are the conditions or the limiting conditions in Washington, because clearly are different from what we know about New York or Michigan. And, and then just briefly also say, what are your management uh, in terms of nutrition? And more specifically, probably nitrogen and calcium application. When you said limiting conditions, you actually lost me there a bit. Specifically, what are you looking for in response to that? Yeah, well, so important is the soil. So again, Lee mentioned that in Washington, we normally do not have um, a limiting condition in terms of calcium availability. And that's something that I can share with you all. And also we have in most of our growing area is more as kind of like a silt loam type of soil uh, with very low organic matter and we have high pH. So maybe I answered that question. Uh, yeah. But overall, what are those limiting factors? Because the levels of organic matter in Washington are really low below the 0.1. So that is key probably for a lot of uh, root health conditions. So I wanted to make um, kind of like a context of Washington and then move on to the practice. Okay, I'll make one quick observation in regards to limiting factors. We farm over a very wide uh, geographical area with many different soil types from actually sandy loam to heavy clays. And we have significantly different levels of calcium and potassium in some of those soils. Um, but it's interesting to note that one of the locations where we actually have our highest soil potassium levels is an orchard that actually produces the least amount of bitter pit. Uh, and one of the orchards that has absolutely the lowest potassium levels tends to have the highest incidence or higher incidence of bitter pit. But they're obviously very different climatically. Um, I'll run through our basic uh, program. Um, we have over the last, um, our standard program used to be that we would put 30 to 40 pounds of, this is on a mature orchard, 30 to 40 pounds of nitrogen broadcast across the entire orchard floor uh, with the intent of actually trying to feed the cover crop a bit. And then we might add another 10 to 20 to 30 pounds, depending on what we thought of the tree vigor. Um, over the last few years and doing much more intensive uh, leaf tissue sampling, um, we have backed our nitrogen levels down to, uh, we've, we've done away with trying to feed the cover crop uh, because that gives us too much nitrogen. And we are doing pretty much 99% of our nitrogen with uh, uh, fertigation applied through drip, but we're only doing about 10 pounds of actual N per acre. Uh, we're using calcium nitrate, actually what we're using is CN9, because we're after uh, a higher level of calcium, if at all possible. Uh, we have a typical spray program as far as other nutrients in Washington, uh, zinc, boron, Uh, typically done in the spring and fall. We do we do, do a, uh, a foliar uh, 10 pounds of nitrogen post-harvest, try to get that on, uh, time and weather permitting. Our spray program for calcium has been uh, almost exclusively calcium chloride. Uh, we run the gamut from uh, every time you go through the orchard and there's not a compatibility issue, which may result in well, eight to 10 sprays per year during the growing season to for several years, we actually tried to spray every uh, a minimum of once a week, 
with calcium, calcium chloride. Uh, we have to, to back up Lee's comments about it's just hard to get enough calcium on through the foliar program. We don't really see much difference between uh, spraying the calcium chloride when it's compatible with something else in the orchard, in the spray tank, versus being just very focused on getting the calcium on at uh, uh, once every once a week. Uh, that's a that's a tall order and it's very demanding. And I will come back to you later when we start talking more about irrigation. There's a lot of uh, questions about that, and I know you've done some some work on that. But uh, just to move on on the nutrition side, uh, Chris, can you share what are your nutrient management practices? So, thanks, Bernie. So we uh, we grow mainly uh, Budigalski nine and Honeycrisp, and. Uh, We've got a couple different sites. One of our sites is uh, a little bit more of a clay loam and the other sites more of a loam, loamier sand. So we've got two different, uh, two different areas that we actually treat. And so when we go to plant an orchard, we know that using Budigowski 9 that uh, we for sure have to push that tree the first three years. There's no doubt about it. Uh, if we're gonna use the uh, benefits of the, of the Bud 9 as far as bitter pit control, then, then we gotta push this, the tree, we gotta fill the space. So. Usually the first year when we, when we plant the tree, um, we give it uh, just enough water to make sure that, uh, that the, the tree is surviving. Uh, you can overwater uh, trees the first year. The second year uh, will definitely hit the water a lot harder. And uh, we don't give any ground applied fertilizer the first year. Uh, as soon as that tree goes through transplant shock, year two, year three is when you really want to push the tree hard and fill space. So we do push the tree hard year two and year three, we'll put on, uh, at least three to four shots, usually four shots calcium nitrate at about uh, about 25 pounds of actual N. That is a, that is a band application. Um, we uh, after we've got our space filled, uh, we'll uh, back off the calcium nitrate. We'll put on uh, once that tree's established in a, in a fruity mode. We'll we'll look at putting at least one to two shots of calcium nitrate on early from that pink to petal fall stage. And that depends on, uh, we've got some areas where we get really good tree growth and we got some areas in the same block where it needs a little bit of help. So we'll uh, uh, treat it accordingly. Uh, we do spray a lot of calcium nitrate on the orchard. Um, uh, in Michigan, we're, we're, we, uh, in the spring, we're always spraying it seems like. So we've always got calcium in the tank. And then we will try and put calcium nitrate on in the in season after our primary scab is over. And we'll try and get that calcium on once a week. But um, we have used a lot of calcium chloride in the past. Um, we do use a lot of other forms, uh, other brands of, uh, of foliar calciums. Um, we do use uh, some gypsum as well, uh, but we really try and push that tree at an early, at a early uh, uh, in the earlier years. And I do believe that the genetics and the bud nine uh, really help us on, on bitter pit control. So we got to keep, uh, we got to keep pushing that tree as much as possible. And, and uh, it's basically, it's a visual on, on looking at the tree and how hard we pushed it. So Michigan's kind of a, a, a funny state. It, we seem to have extremes one way or the other. And it seems like when everybody's doing their hardest to try and uh, 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 minimize bitter pit, there's some years where everybody has a little bit of bitter pit. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, when the fruit leaves the orchard, it always looks great. And then it gets into storage and the next thing you know, they're packing the fruit and, and it has a little more bitter pit than we anticipated. So I think we have extreme weather in, in Michigan, meaning, you know, this year we had uh, at least six weeks, if not eight weeks of drought here this last week and we got five to seven inches of rain. So we go from one extreme to the other. And uh, I, I think that makes it a little bit tough for bitter pit control. Uh, I, we've got some older, uh, some some bigger root stocks on the farm and uh, not on Honeycrisp, but on uh, some other varieties. We've done a lot of root pruning and actually less some test trees. I and mean, you can actually see uh, the control of bitter pit uh, right to the tree uh, when we did do quite a bit of root pruning and we actually believe it or not we actually uh, picked up a little bit more color because less vigor and actually picked up another pound uh, in that fruit at, at harvest time so we do a lot of playing on the farm and and uh, that that might be something that if, if somebody's got some uh, 
very vigorous root stocks on honeycrisp, you might want to look at uh, root prunes while you got uh, some type of support system. So, but thank you, Chris. Great, great advice. Um, uh, Rod. So, yeah, great comments from both Bruce and Chris, and very similar to what we're doing. And, and I make a sort of overarching comment that what becomes quite apparent is that people who are succeeding at this are doing a lot to manipulate their orchards, their nutrition status, their rootstocks, their canopies. And you can't stop doing any particular one part of it. You have to pay this real attention to detail on all parts. So for our, our attention to detail in terms of nutrition, for a very long time, we had, um, I'm sure Leyland would, would say quite a different nutrition program for most in New York. And we're not putting on any nitrogen fertilizers on any varieties, honey crisp included before bloom. And have kind of changed that a little bit specifically for honey crisp and, and gone now to almost completely all um, nitrogen applied to established blocks where the canopy is filled is foliar post harvest. So we're trying to build some strength into that bud and give us a little bit of pop in the, in the early part of the season. But there's, there's no nitrogen applied on established canopies on the ground after that. Now we do have high organic matter numbers. So we usually range in the two to three percent, three and a half percent in some blocks. So we have a lot of natural nitrogen that's, that's coming to us every season, no matter what. Um, one of the other things that I think has really helped us in terms of, of calcium and, and, and managing bit effect, most of our productive honeycrisp orchards are on B9, so that limits the percentage you're going to get um, ordinarily. And, and we'd be surprised on any season to get over 5%, so it's typically not a significant issue, but 5% of a honeycrisp crop is a lot of dollars. So, you know, you're trying to manage it back down to as close to zero as you can get. But some of, um, some of Terence's work and others with nailing in terms of the lack of calcium availability, if there's a drought stress period shortly after bloom, um, has influenced how we do our irrigation scheduling now. So Honeycrisp gets a lot more water a lot quicker if we sense any kind of rainfall shortage or soil moisture deficit at bloom or that month right after. I think we've definitely seen some benefits from that. And we do spray, we've only ever really sprayed calcium chloride. We did a lot of work 20 years ago with different chelated calciums and all the different snake oil that came through. And all we ever did was spend more money and didn't get any more results. And basically on a once a week calcium chloride program, and the only way to get to Lee's 40 or 50 pounds is to do it 14 or 15 times. We don't like to spray more than three pounds per acre per application in about 60 gallons of water. Otherwise we lift, um, risk some beef burning. So, you know, there's, there's, there's always a balance to what you're trying to do. From our perspective, the cost of that calcium in an application if it can make us 1% or 2% of a crop every year or avoid a 6 or 7% year, then the payback is, is good. And it's about maintaining that focus on details and trying to do everything you can to maximize its value. Never want to throw money away, but there's, there's some things that, that really, especially with Honeycrisp, that you, you lose at the peril. We had a really good conversation at the end of the IFTA meetings and, and Bernadita pretty much convinced me I should stop spraying calcium every week. And then you go to bed at night and put your head on the pillow and go, well, it sounds great, but hell no. <laughs> so I don't know, Bernadita. I, I think have company... to spend more time then with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I, and I think there's probably nine years out of 10, there's, there's probably every reason to argue that and we may be wasting some money. But sleeping at night has a, has a price too. So, um, you know, it's all, everything's risk management, and, and how you how you do that economically in your own mind is is a very individual thing. So we're not a lot different. In, you know, we're very similar to Chris's program in terms of nitrogen and calcium management. Just trying to pay attention to every little detail where we can gain a step here and a step there amongst you know a thousand steps to get to the end. Thank you, Rod. And, and a question for the three of you. 
have you ever tried to do a, a trial and to not add calcium at all and compare with a calcium application spray? I'm talking about the spray calcium. So for those of you that do apply gypsum, I, I think it's a good strategy because not only for calcium, but also other uh, problems that you might have in your soils. But in regards to the spray, have you ever not apply anything and compare between sprayed and non-spray? The only comparison we've ever done is frequency of, of uh, treatments. And our lowest frequency is oh, eight to 10 applications versus the 15 plus and really have not seen much of any difference. I would say that we definitely see if we looked at a 10 year trend, we definitely see less bit of pit since we've been spraying on a basically a week, weekly basis in general. It, it's hard to put your finger on it. Part of it may just be tree age, right? So you know, we're not doing scientific experiments to know that, but part of it's something that comes. But a, a different way to, to question to, to, uh, to the Washington community, Bruce, is could be, do we have Washington fruit grower not applying calcium foliarly and not having bitter pit issues? Do, do we have those growers? To my, knowledge, to my knowledge, virtually every Washington grower applies calcium of some type in some form. Uh, Only when Lee and I get our hands on the orchard, probably. <laughs> I, I've seen one orchard that that said they did not apply any calcium and it was it was uh, uh, extremely low vigor site on B9 in a very high elevation cool site. And that's probably where it wasn't needed. But that would be the far exception to the rule. Okay. So there's a lot of questions and we don't have too much time, but I want to go back to the irrigation just so we don't miss that question that has come, come on and on in, in every session. Uh, Bruce, you mentioned that you've been changing your irrigation scheduling and that you think, or you, in the video at least, you think you make a difference. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, we, um, our standard irrigation system is a um, sprinkler system which is both under tree and over tree uh, under tree for frost control in the spring over tree for summer cooling we also have a drip system in most of our orchards over the last two years we have uh, done a significant amount of trying to apply depth irrigation um, Unfortunately, this year that went out the board this far over the end of the ship uh, this week. We we're, we're dumping every gallon of water we get our hands on trying to mitigate 115 degree temperatures. Um, but we have we have invested a lot of time and effort into trying to manage our irrigation to make sure that we're not over irrigating, even if we're not trying to induce a uh, a deficit, which we are intentionally trying to induce a deficit in Honeycrisp. Uh, we've done such a huge amount of cooling over the last 15, 20 plus years, actually 25 plus years, that we've seen the, the, the negative effects if you create a swamp in your orchard. Mm. And I think that if you back that up, if you're over irrigating or if you're, if you're in an a farm situation where you regularly irrigate, if you're over irrigating, I think that potentially has a significant negative impact, not just on Honeycrisp, but uh, all the apples you grow. But we are fortunate in Washington where uh, we, can, we can control the amount of water you put on the trees, which is not true necessarily in New York or in the Midwest. Bernadette? This is SC. Can I uh, make a quick comment about irrigation? Of course. 
as as you know, we have done over uh, oh I think eighteen something years of extensive irrigation study in Idaho uh, on mostly on Fuji. One one thing that we noticed in all of our trials was that whenever we are using the method of irrigation makes a major difference on potassium uptake. For drip, when we are using drip versus sprinkler, drip has um, less uptake of potassium. And every time that was true. And then the other one is that, that uh, um, whenever um, you have more volume of water, you have more potassium. <laughs> Because all of discussion we had here about potassium, I think that's very important to pay attention to irrigation. That was one of the questions that audience asked and I was uh, very interested to uh, mention this. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Essie, and, and probably Lee also have something to add to that question on how irrigation management impact nutrient uptake and what are the critical timing to be aware of? Yeah, Essie, Essie put it how I would put it. Um, but Berdita, you have a project on on timing of uptake. Do you wanna do you wanna weigh in on that? Yeah, well, so thank you, Lee. Um, for me, I I don't wanna. There's so many topics, right, that uh, we would like to cover in in. It's like almost seven minutes left, but I would like to kind of bring it back to maybe just two key points. One is that, first of all, the importance that everyone have indicated, and there's reviews from the 70s and before that, that show the importance of uptake early in the season uh, for calcium development of the cell wall. So that, that stage, and, and you have mentioned this, Lee, of that deficit irrigation early stage is really uh, fatal for bitter pit uh, development. And, and so the irrigation has to be secure in that early stage because it relates to the uptake of calcium through the roots, which is the main way pathway, right? And to develop that cell wall. So that for me is uh, a key. And, and that's why also last week when we talk about drought and dry, there are a lot of reports that already support the idea that Terran was hypothesizing that shows that dry weather will affect an increased bitter pit, especially that early in the season, and supported with a lot of your work, Lee. But secondly, is this uh, work that we've been doing, and there's also a lot of support that shows that, and AC mentioned this before, we're talking about rootstock, crop load, uh, nitrogen levels, and I think everything comes down to the excessive vigor. Uh, when we have high crop load, we have a more uh, balanced tree. When we have low crop load, we have more shoot competition. And, and that translate into more water uptake and water uptake translate into more potassium uptake that AC mentioned uh, last time too. So if you have a vigorous rootstock, you need to control the vigor, especially later in the season where calcium no longer can get into your fruit but you do have still uptake of nitrogen and potassium because both elements are very mobile in your plant. And that's why AC probably show also that leaf tissue relation, potassium to calcium is a good indicator for fruit size because potassium is a mobile element and it will increase when you have higher size of fruit because of that increase of water. So it's all related for me to vigor. So if you control vigor later in the season by managing water, by managing even root pruning, if you wanna play with root pruning later in the season, that is an option, but also a lot of the work done by this group from Brazil that shows PGR use are also related to that controlling vigor later in the season. So those are kind of my, my my key message, early season, secure calcium availability and root growth, and later in the season, control the vigor of your orchard, which you are doing by having a, a more dwarfing rootstock. But if you don't have that, you can control by the deficit irrigation that Lee has shown uh, a lot of information regarding that reduced uh, bitter pit level with that deficit irrigation later in the season. 
or, or root pruning, I know, and then, uh, you know, some growers are also trying, you know, taking off some of the excess vigorous shoots that are on their tree to get it to calm down or, or, or breaking the tips. There's, yeah, there's a lot of different approaches. Some are pruning. Yeah, there's a lot of different approaches to just reduce that leaf area later. Bernadita, when you mentioned the Brazilian group is, are those apogee trials pre-harvest? Yes, these are five. Can you share? Yes, so this uh, work is done by, you can <laughs> online on Google for, um, um, Amarantes or the Freitas, that group has done a lot of work and, and carry over, over work from tomato with the uh, brown end rot, which is another calcium related disorder. They continue the work with apples and, and they have done uh, amazing reviews and summaries of uh, what could be the, the, the problem. And, and so if you look online for Amarantes and the Freitas, you will find that paper. And that what they show is that uh, a later application of uh, Apogee was uh, very good five weeks before harvest every week, reduced bitter pit levels. Off label. Completely. <laughs> yes. Okay, so but the, point well. is, yeah, the point is, I think it's about that uh, bigger, bigger management. There are also other uh, topics that Lailang mentioned about uh, the ripening or maduration that uh, I think I agree with you, Lailang. I think it's very, I'm, I'm very curious about that situation. And I think this is something we could cover in the next meeting in post-harvest because there is a preliminary work that has shown, I think it was uh, from Ferguson in New Zealand that show how the re rate of ripening uh, accelerates when you have lower levels of calcium. So high levels of calcium in the fruit reduce the ripening process. And that also leads to uh, a reduced levels of uh, bitter pit. Um, so that, that's very interesting to follow up on that. Hey, Bernadita, I see Chris, he keeps unmuting himself. Chris, do you have something to add? We keep talking about yeah, just, pruning and irrigation. Yeah, I just, I just thinking a little bit. So, you know, I was talking to Anna today and, and one thing, we, we got some great information. We got some great information on rootstocks. Uh, we've talked about uh, um, uh, calcium and nutrition. But one thing that, you know, in my travels that I see is that there's a lot of orchards that are planted that uh, you, you have to make sure your, your basics are covered and you have to make sure the site is prepared properly. You pick the right site. If it's a wet site, then you're going to have to put the right amount of drain tile, if not a little bit more in. Irrigation's a must when it comes to these dwarfing rootstocks. When you put, you know, when you plant an orchard, you know, you have to be ready to get that irrigation in ASAP, especially if it's been dry for, for 14 days. So, in this in these conversations, it, it's really good, but there's a lot of there's a lot of things that I see growers that miss, and you know support systems, making sure the right support system. I can't tell you how many times I walk into an orchard, and, and so many of the leaders aren't tied up. But you know, just make sure that the, the sites are prepared. So if you're going to use Budakowski nine, you have to have everything in place. You have to have a vision. And you have to have a plan, and the spacing has to be right. And you're, you're going to have to plan on being aggressive and you're going to have to plan on uh, feeding that tree the first three or four years and then backing off. The payoff with Bud and Dine on Honeycrisp is, is the back end. It's like buying a stock. You can either, you can pay up front or you can pay at the end. Uh, it's, it's your choice, but you definitely need to put some work into planning and, and some of these systems and consistency. You need consistency and you need to babysit these trees the first, the first year, the second year, third year, you need to be out looking at these trees all the time and seeing what they need. You need, need to make sure that they're being sprayed. You get the aphids off them, the hoppers off them, no, no apple scab on the leaves, you know, no powdery mildew. You have to keep these trees in, in, in tip top shape. And uh, um, I just want to make those comments because if you pick a rootstock, if you want to use a Geneva rootstock or Bud 9, and you don't do these basic fundamentals, it'll be a disaster at the end of the day. So you won't meet your full potential, so. And yeah, to, to support that good quality trees from the nursery that are uniform, um, that's 
that's essential if you're going to be kind of riding on the edge of of riding on the edge of bud nine. Yeah, yeah. Um, could I ask Bruce um, a question on the um, compost application? Because in the video, Bruce, oh. you you mentioned that. Um, for some of the blocks, you have Honeycrisp blocks, you have been applying up to 10 tons of compost. So oh, just yeah. a curious about up the to 25 tons. Uh, up to 25 tons. So just curious about the nitrogen content of those compost. Um, so and you also made the comment that, you know, we, we stop applying nitrogen, but the different nitrogen level stays uh, up there around 2.4, 2.5. So I just want to try to find yeah. out if it has um, anything to do with the compost application. Good question. Um, to Chris's point, our standard pre-plant program is, and this is whether it's Honeycrisp or any other variety, is uh, uh, old orchard site, tree removal, uh, deep ripping, uh, typically with a uh, uh, D8 or D7 cat down to 36 to 42 inches. Um, fumigation, uh, post fumigation, this application of 20 to 25 tons of uh, typically um, uh, dairy compost. Uh, Yakima Valley, uh, Columbia Basin is a big dairy producing region, so it's readily available. I'm guessing because I get different reports from different vendors um probably two and a half three percent uh one of the negative aspects of this is, is we're dumping a huge amount of potassium on the ground as we're uh yeah that's uh, that's another compost but we're we're trying to fill the space irrespective of whatever the rootstock is by the end of the third leaf uh, okay. and so we're we're very aggressive about this uh, prepping the soil, the comments about irrigation system, trellis, having the limbs tied up, all that. Chris is spot on. Uh, you don't, you, your whole process should be so well organized that it's not a matter of finding something to add to the plant. It's a matter of avoiding making any timing mistakes and subtracting from the execution by being sloppy or late. Uh, if you do that, uh, you know, I think it's very realistic to be able to fill your space in by the end of the third year. Yeah. So, Bruce, if uh, if the nitrogen content is two percent, if you apply ten tons per acre, that yeah. gives you four hundred pounds of nitrogen total yeah. nitrogen. In the first few years, probably in the next two to three years, the first year probably you get you know thirty to fifty percent of that nitrogen. And then later years, you may get you know, one third, one third roughly. But even by the year four or five, probably you still have some nitrogen in there. So do you think that allows the trees to stay at the high nitrogen level, even though you, you, know, you didn't apply any chemical fertilizer? Uh, yeah, I suspect it would, but I mean, I'm talking about blocks that are uh, 10th, 15th leaf. So they're oh, okay. moved from a um, compost program. But we also used to go through up until about four years ago with uh, two to three tons of compost okay. applied per orchard acre, but it would be uh, two to three tons that was banded into the herbicide strip. We went away from that. We thought that potentially was having a deleterious effect on uh, uh, fruit condition. Uh, okay. So we we once we get a block, uh, once a block is the tour, we're not using compost. Yeah, I think that's very important. Uh, it's uh, Bill Bramlage, uh, a professor at UMass, used to say that uh, he had in a farm and Anahi. There, there was a farm in, Mass in Massachusetts where it was an old dairy farm. You know, these manures were sprayed and then that orchard never produced a good quality fruit for the entire, uh, you know, life of the orchard. So yeah. I think sometimes you, if you apply too much, uh, you know, manure or compost, 
the nitrogen level stays high and also potassium if it's if it's a chicken you know those uh, compost there's a lot of potassium in it as well so yeah. just want to yeah yeah, to your point, Lailang, I think that's one of the limiting factors that we've seen in Washington is that, well, two things. One is that uh, the material is high in potassium. It's the the mineral lo yeah. mineralogy of the rock is high in potassium. It's fertile, yes. But also, yeah. a lot of the orchards come from either a dairy farms or they put a lot of manure with had high levels of potassium and also phosphorus actually, they, they correlate yes. very well. High levels of potassium and high levels of phosphorus in the soil, but also some of them come from potato. So potato yes. also is a high demand in, in potassium. So growers apply a lot of potassium. And because most of the soils are silt soil, that potassium have not moved away. Stays there, yes. Exactly. Yes, that's yeah. that's the important uh, uh, yeah. factor to, to consider. Yeah, and I, I would love to show this in another time, but like you show, uh, Ted and show the, the um, uh, levels of potassium in the soil for different orchards. We've done this also with a project that we have with Lee and Specialty Crop Program. This is the last year. Mm -hmm. And 60, more than 60% of our orchard were excessive in potassium. And probably you will be very surprised, but we have sites that have above 700 parts per million of potassium in the soil. Wow, that's 1,400 pounds of potassium per acre. Exactly. For the top six inches. So that's. that's Tim Smith calculated many years ago from WSU Extension that there's a 3,000 year supply of potassium in <laughs> typical central Washington soil. Yeah, we can uh -huh. sell we can sell a little bit of soil and share some potassium here, but but also to I think just going back to Bruce that says that in the high levels of potassium and this is important for me to say because I think this integrated approach uh, to understand what is your limiting factor because I agree with Bruce there are soils that are very high in potassium and the trees are weak and the trees are low in bitter pit and that's mostly what I've seen here in Washington is because those soils are also very high in sodium that comes also with the compost but also the salinity levels and pH levels are very high in mm -hmm. this soil so your problem is, is maybe potassium levels are secondary and your biggest problem maybe is high salinity. And we've seen that in some orchards in the Marua area, which are sandy soils, but we still have a layer that impedes drainage. So the, the, the problem that you have there is a different problem. And the other yeah. way around too, we have soils that have very low levels of uh, potassium and you have high levels of bitter pit and probably your problem there might be nitrogen or water excessive water or something yeah, so, yeah. or tree vigor exactly yeah. tree, tree vigor is a biggie on the topic yeah. of compost you know uh, we haven't done a really good job of keeping the information that a finished compost is under three quarters of a percent in mm -hmm. and anything that's in the two to three percent range is basically uh, manure and uh, it hasn't been turned or really well processed uh, to be an organic material source uh, compost. And, and so there's, there's really an interesting spread. Yeah. Uh, and, and going through my 1970s era soils class where we talked about green manure crops and manure applications and, and, and all of that, it's, it's pretty important to understand uh, of what you're applying. Now, yes. the Research Commission did a trial with uh, composted yard waste in a regulated deficit irrigation. Actually, it was a partial root zone uh, irrigation trial with uh, horse Kaspari in Quincy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had some trees that looked really, really weak uh, from the irrigation treatment in uh, Granstein put in some compost on the surface, and, and this was a buried drip trial. So there was actually no water going through the, the compost whatsoever. 
but those treated trees uh, were so different in their uh, leaf color, vigor, and, and, and all of that. It looked like they were fertilized and farmed completely separate. And it was just a four inch application of organic matter on top of the buried drip. And um, we did a series of leaf and samples and uh, it was amazing to see what that layer of compost uh, on top of the soil. It was four inches deep by three by three under each of the trees that were planted uh, 14 by six. So organic matter and water uh, play such big roles that sometimes we get caught up in chasing the details and miss the big picture. Yep. Thank you, Tom. I think that some of our leaf nitrogens and Honeycrisp production are somewhere between one six and 2%. So I think a, a number of our Honeycrisp growers are running a lower nitrogen level. And I think that 2% is a, is a breaking point for annual cropping that if we get too low, that we'll trigger some biennial bearing. Absolutely, Tom. I just want to emphasize that even with the gala, our trials show that when the leaf nitrogen level gets below 1.7, 1.6, the trees just don't form flowers. So with the honeycrisp, I think the situation is even worse because it's you know prone to biennial bearing to begin with. So I think uh, when you control leaf nitrogen level, you don't wanna go to the extreme. That's very important. And also when you bring the leaf nitrogen level to you know, below, let's say 1.9%, the zonal chlorosis would show up earlier and more severe. So just keep that in mind. Thanks everyone to stayed on with us this late this evening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye.